take a long time introducing you. If you would like, you can do it yourself. Uh, I'm just giving the floor to you. Uh, this is Mark Uzan, Executive Director and Founder of the Ringland and Bretton Woods Committee. Uh, to all participants of uh, this meeting, please feel free to text your questions to chat or to Q&A um, of this Zoom meeting. So I will monitor the questions and uh, in the end, we will have the chance to discuss what most interests you uh, after Mr. Rosan finishes his talk. So Mr. Rosan, the floor is yours. Well, good, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Apologies for the delay. I think I had some problem to enter Zoom uh, with a link, but I think we resolved the technical issues. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be able to address uh, uh, the audience, the member of this uh, Olympiad, and I wish all of them uh, great luck for their endeavors. What I wanted to do this morning here uh, from Paris is clearly to give you not uh, a lecture per se, as I'm not a, a professor, but clearly some um, thinking, some remarks about where the global economy is heading, not through a type of um, forecasting about the global economic outlook, but for you as a young generation, thinking about when you are starting to enter the marketplace and the job opportunities or where you want to study economics, you are starting to wonder how this uh, pandemic COVID-19 might affect your own lives. And if I have to think about type of um, research interest about um, post-COVID-19, what would be the subject that I should be concerned about? Is macroeconomics as a textbook? Yesterday, you have the pleasure to receive a welcoming note from uh, Professor Mankiw, who, uh, who has a leading textbook in macroeconomics. Is the way we are going to write macroeconomics in the next 10 years would be different. And in a sense that um, when you think about macroeconomics, you think about big numbers, you think about fiscal policy, you think about monetary policy, you think about an independent central bank, you think about uh, price stability, you think about growth. And when before COVID-19, we were concerned about something else. We were concerned that for many years in the advanced countries, from the US, from Europe and Japan, we were living in a period of low growth, low inflation, while Larry Summers, a well-known professor of economics at Harvard University, former US Secretary of Treasury, talked about secular stagnation, meaning that you know, in advanced countries, we were going through a period that due to demographic trends, due to uh, low, low productivity, that the world was entering a period of low growth and low inflation. And so we were thinking about, do we need to think about macroeconomics in different terms? So that was a post COVID-19, you know, policymakers were wondering where to maybe need to think about increasing inflation. Why we don't have inflation in the world in the advanced countries? What was the puzzle behind that? And, um, and COVID-19, you know, arrived and COVID-19 triggered, you know, the most um, worst recession in the world for the advanced countries and for emerging markets. You feel like an eternity, you know, six months that we have been talking about this pandemic. Uh, this is something that I believe that economic historians will consider as a defining moment for the 21st century. So I will encourage all the students here to look back at history and to see how this event, which is unprecedented, will affect the world economy, will in retrospect affect you know, growth around the world, and I think will, act, will really affect our assumptions about what macroeconomics is all about. Um, if you look, at uh, the forecast for the global economy that came out uh, last April from the IMF, that the global economy will be going down by 5%, that emerging market will suffer uh, by 3%, you know, down growth. So we are going to go to uncharted territory that we don't know anymore what will be the right policy tools, the right policy mix that you know, we need to use at a time where the world 
is facing not only this pandemic, so health crisis, that these great recessions in a way has been triggered by government because they decided for obvious reason that health was a priority. So in that context, they decided to suspend the global economy. They decided to suspend economic activity from the US, from Europe, through different lockdowns that we have been witnessing. And now we are dealing with way how we can reopen the economy. So it's like from a student in economics, a supply shock and a demand shock at the same time. So how do you navigate, you know, to deal with this type of crisis where you know that we are need to deal with so many uncertainties? Uncertainty about health, uncertainty about forecasting, you know, the outlook. You know, what will be the price of oil in the next few months? Impossible to find out because you don't know if activity will be picked up. If I take uh, where our host is here in Kazakhstan, you know, if you are an economist or minister of finance or minister of economy, it's very hard to predict, or it's very hard to look at the forecast about oil because it's impossible more or less to see where the global economy will pick up again. We are dealing with stop and go situation. Sudden stop. We are here in Europe, and in, if you look at the news, you know, from France, from Spain, from Germany, we are dealing with so many cases. So we don't know if we are going to go again to a student stop of the economy that can be very abrupt. So many commentators have been comparing this um, sudden stop of uh, global economy activity to uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 and even to the Great Depression of 1929. Of course, uh, if you take this analogy, this crisis is, as I mentioned before, very different because it has been triggered by government because health was a priority. And he has not been triggered like in 2008 by a problem in the financial sector, in the banking sector. And in fact, you can argue that the banks and the financial system were the first responders in economics. It was the one who had been in the front line to help households, to help companies, to make sure that credit can continue to flow to the companies, to make sure that we are not going to deal with a series of bankruptcies. Of course, government was there to guarantee these loans, but the banks play their role, you know, in trying to make sure that we are not going from, you know, a wave of bankruptcies in advanced countries and in emerging market. So from a student in international economics or from a student in economics, you know, if they look at this crisis and to think about what should be my research moving forward, uh, is, should I compare this crisis, as I mentioned, with the Great Depression or with the, um, the 2008 crisis? Would it be a good research? Will I need to advise my government or you know, the policymakers about what should be the agenda moving forward? What we should do as a country, not only to deal with the short-term effect of this crisis, but also to look at what kind of country or what kind of macroeconomic policy or what kind of growth model we will need to go after. If I look at Central Asia, you know, a lot of growth models were really driven by three parts. Tourism, of course, was a, a major driver for growth, you know, opening up the countries to attract tourists. Of course, natural resources, oil, uranium, other aspects that were really driven. It was a big cycle of this price, of increase of prices of these commodities. And trade. And if you look at these three drivers, they are more or less in a standstill. Commodities due to, of course, the need to deal with climate change will not be anymore the major driver for global growth and for economic growth for Central Asia, particularly for Kazakhstan as a major exporter. Trade is upside down. You know, you don't know anymore what should be the rule of the game of trade for moving forward as we are dealing with a major you know, confrontations, as people sometimes argue, a major new type of Cold War between the US and China that, of course, has big effect on the World Trade Organization and the rule of the game of international trade. So, well, we don't know anymore if trade would be the next driver for growth. And, of course, tourism has been affected 
because the global growth model was all about not social distancing, but getting together. It was all about global network. It was all about trade, exchange, you know, the network, you know, we build global, you know, supply chain. And suddenly it looked at the whole system, the whole growth model is falling apart. Does it mean that this crisis, this pandemic, has killed globalizations? That I believe would be a very good topic for students in economics. Why I will argue that indeed, I think the pandemic has killed globalization. Because I believe that trends that were there before, before COVID-19 have been magnified, meaning that there was already a trend towards the digitalization of the global economy. There was already a trend that trade will be less intensive, and there was more or less a trend that geopolitics was becoming the new driver when we think about globalizations. Every country is trying to reassert their own sovereignty. Every country is looking at becoming again independent becoming more strategic. So trade become another way of thinking strategically. You know, should I want to export my uh, food products to the rest of the world? Security become more important. Should I be part of a global value chain or should the value chain become more strategic and become more regional? In the case of the EU, the new narrative in the European Union, and you mentioned we discussed it yesterday briefly, has been way for the first time to recognize that we need to become more strategic in the front of China and the US. So the, U, the EU has been working on a, for the first time on a program entitled the European Recovery Fund and also to be able for the first time to issue debt as European Union level. We will have the EU debt to help countries to recover and to build up a recovery fund that is more or less comparing to the Marshall Plan after World War II to help countries in the EU to recover from this crisis. So everything become more geostrategic, everything become more geopolitic. And so globalization's patterns, what globalization was all about, opening up the economies, opening up capital flow, opening up trade, I think is coming to an end. I don't think that the narrative and the paradigm for the next students in economics will be to study globalization. It's going to study that countries, nations become more important. We go back to the power of nations. We go back to the need to look at our own sovereignty. So you ask me, is this thing have something to do about economics? Economics is all about exchange it's about creating economic activity. It's about your interaction with the rest of the world. So the field of international economics will be very different in the years to come. We have been working for many years about capital flow. Remember, whatever the Federal Reserve, the global central bank, if you wish, was doing, has always had a huge impact about the patterns of capital flow to the rest of the world. When the Federal Reserve lower interest rates, there was a huge capital outflow, uh, inflow to emerging market because everyone was looking to invest their money to emerging market. And if you look carefully at what happened in March 2020, you saw how emerging markets were affected by COVID-19 as a lot of investors, you know, withdrew their money from emerging market and went back to US or to Europe. And there was almost $100 billion of capital outflow to emerging market. And for many years, central banks and government in emerging market were always trying to find a way to manage capital flow. And they never wanted at that time, except for a few countries, to impose capital control. So that was the spirit of globalization. That was the spirit of openness. And I believe that um, this paradigm is coming to an end due to COVID-19, but also to the trend that were already in existence before COVID. So if I look at the world economy moving forward, I think we are going to enter a period of major uncertainties. That's number one. Uh, a period where every kind of government will try to reassert its own sovereignty, 
to become very strategic. That uh, is going to be very difficult on the short term to deal with a huge high level of unemployment, that we are going to deal with an important need for social safety net for social inclusion. As country, we'll have a harder time you know, to get growth of a magnitude of five or six percent that might have been the average for emerging markets. So we need to look at alternatives, at um, maybe also the type of growth model that are going to be driven more with domestic demand. You know, so I would encourage students in economics to say the opportunity to look at COVID-19 not only as a, as a sense of anxiety, but also maybe as an opportunity for country. Oh, I can shift my economy and my growth model due to COVID-19. What were the weaknesses that you know, were in my economy? I was maybe too dependent on commodities. I need to diversify my economies. I need to, be, to embrace climate change. I need to become a low carbon economy. Oh, I can expand green finance. Oh, I can become a green economy. What should be the opportunities? What kind of infrastructure will we need to build in this context, you know? Infrastructure in terms of transportation. How I can make cities more inclusive, more livable. Think about globalization that we're always part of our thinking about global city. We believe that global financial centers were driven because you have a global economy, that capital were flowing, New York, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong. Maybe the concept of global financial center also will change dramatically. It's not because you are based in New York, we are going to move away from mega cities. A world we look, if we think that this pandemic is going to be the new narrative, a new way of living, a new way of thinking, people are looking at social distancing, not because I don't want to interact with you face to face, but I need now to think about, you know, live able, you know, to be able to be in an ecosystem that is going to be more important, you know, for, for our planet as a world. So I think there are a lot of new opportunities for economics, for students in international economics. I think we will need, as, you know, our well-known French philosopher Descartes, du passé faisons table rase, don't think about the past. You cannot change the past, but you can change the future. So I would encourage students in economics to think about it to, about the new age of imagination. Not to think about, should I find a job tomorrow? But to encourage them to study, to encourage them to go to this new field, AI, big data. The future of money as student economics will always, what is all money is about? You know, money will change dramatically. We are going to go to a field where we might uh, be in the next 10 years, the end of fiat money, we will not, you know, maybe use cash anymore. We just use our uh, iPhone or Android to pay for anything. So it's very important to look at the economics of platform. What these platforms are all about? Why they became monopolies? From Amazon to all the type of um, platform economy. This is another field where I believe students in economics should monitor carefully. So you cannot just analyze economics in a vacuum. You cannot just do modeling and no, you need to take into account that our ecosystem is changing dramatically. Remember, international economics was all about international corporations and now institutions reinventing Bretton Woods was in fact the spirit of Bretton Woods. The spirit of international corporations of the visionaries of World War II to build up a system for international corporations and to build up a system to make sure that we will prevent instability that was so important during the interwar years. Currency instability, financial instability, they were unfortunately the trigger, one of the major triggers for the conflict with the Second World War. So I would encourage students to think about not only economics, but to think of what will be the underpinnings of this new economics. Because we will need to have new institutions. I talk about green economy, I talk about climate change. We need to be present as a creation of this new institution that will emerge 
to deal with climate change, to deal with uh, economics of platform, because at the end, you will need international cooperation. You cannot do by yourself. Of course, nations will reassert their own sovereignty, but they will need to deal always with the rest of the world. Kazakhstan is not an island. You are landlocked countries. You need the rest of the world. You will need to diversify your economies. And uh, other Central Asia countries will need to adapt themselves also. So this is a, a major moment in history. We have major tectonic uh, uh, phases. But um, uh, what makes, I think, um, this crisis, COVID-19, so unique? He has been induced by policymakers. He has been induced by government for one reason, because we have to save life and health was a priority. So um, I think there are a lot of oppo good opportunities for students uh, to continue to study international economics. To look at this crisis, this moment, I think I, I would say, you know, for economic historian, it will be the defining moment for the 21st century. So in that, because we are living in a, with uh, this period of history, testing times for everyone, you know, because you don't know what you future lies. Maybe you were supposed to go to universities in the US or in Europe, and now you have to do only online discussions. So you might be frustrated, you might be disappointed, but you see, you are young. So with young, you, you should be creative. You should be in a spirit of imagining the world of the 21st century, because at the end, you are the capacity to change things. Look at this young generation of people who are advocating, you know, we need to do something to save our planet. Look at our capacity to, thanks to technological change, you know, to imagine a better world and a better place. So I agree that we are living with so many uncertainties, with potential conflict. But I believe also that you think about opening your eyes and I will encourage you institute and I hope that uh, this is something that I will end my, um, my conversations here and I hope that uh, we can discuss and have some questions. We will organize, you know, as part of our work plan here, uh, a forthcoming forum uh, as part of our um, uh, activities entitled The Age of Imaginations. And I think I will encourage your members and your participants to join the forum and maybe really to suggest how they frame this age of imagination. What are their concerns, but also their you know, way of um, thinking about the global economy or thinking about international economics to inspire different generations. COVID-19 is all about feeling about, you know, you have a separation between the old generation, the young generation, because the old has been affected by the virus and they can die of the virus. The young generation believe, oh, you know, it doesn't matter, we are young, we get the virus, we are okay. But life is all about solidarity among people, solidarity among families. So let's embrace, you know, the age of creativity, let's embrace the age of imagination, and at the end, we are only one family, one planet and one not only one country because we like diversity but we need to think not only about ourselves but it is the age of solidarity in front of us thank you very much uh thank you very much mr Rosan, for this uh, inspiring speech and for the invitation for discussion uh, we have a few questions uh, sure. uh, yeah i will uh i will look through them there are uh, people here who would like to ask their questions themselves. So I invite uh, Yorgos Sergei Chirala. Uh, uh, Yorgos Sergei, I promote you to panelists. Now you have the chance to uh, to ask your question yourself, please. Right, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Right, with regards, with special regards to the inevitable global economic interdependence, interdependence Mr. Marcus on, I wanted to ask you, how will the business sector be affected, considering that tourism, particularly for business purposes, has decreased dramatically? And if digitalization is the key to adapt, how can we prevent the extreme rise in cybersecurity crimes? Thank you very much. 
Shall I respond or shall I pick up all the questions together? Let, let me ask you what would be the, your preference. Well, uh, well, given, given that this is this was the question asked uh, in person, maybe it would be a good idea to answer it immediately, and then we, <laughs> yes. we move to the questions which are in text. Yes, sure. Um, it's clear. As a, thank you very much, by the way, for for the questions. Um, it's clear that um, you know the most affected year. If you look at uh, who has been affected by this crisis are really the SMEs, the small and medium companies, because they don't have the capital, you know, to weather this crisis. And some of them who are in um, industry that are all about services, meaning br bringing people together, you know. So if you're doing the event management, you get affected. If you deal with tourism, and I remember in January, in January before COVID, all the discussions and the um, willingness by all the Central Asian countries to create a Silk Road visa. So there was the spirit of the Silk Road, there was a spirit that we are going to bring people to our countries. If you go to Kazakhstan, you can go to Uzbekistan. And I remember when I crossed the border a couple of years ago, it was very difficult. So I can come in, I can go to Kazakhstan, I can go to Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and it was very easy. Now, it seems to me that all the companies who were involved in this tourism, are going to be really impacted. And so what they should do, as you said, you know, they can even have uh, knowledge and building online uh, agency, but I believe they will need, that. that's why the government is so important here. You will need to redeploy a lot of the labor force to new activities. Because, you know, at one point this crisis, unfortunately, is you are very concerned to lose not only jobs, but to lose skills. When people get to go unemployed for a couple of months, they will lose skills. And you know that some industry and some part of activities will disappear until we get you know, an out, a positive outcome. So it's going to be challenging. That's why, you know, at the same time that we deal with this crisis, we need to rethink education. Universities are not just for people who take the degree, go to university. No, university, we need also to be reinventing to be the place for knowledge for everyone who is losing some skills. So that's why, you know, we cannot look at this crisis just from, uh, I will argue from, you know, just a pessimistic point of view. It's redeploying the resources. That's why I believe you are going to have a repurposing of the state the state will have a new purpose. The government is not here to invade you or to, give, to provide the capacity for the business again, you know, to come out of this crisis positively. So reshoring, resilience, repurposing, the three R's that are part of the new keywords, you know, among the people around the world needs to be the new driver for growth and also for small and medium companies. Uh, thank you. There are a few questions which are uh, related to the world after a pandemic. So, uh, how will the world look like? How will people live? Uh, I will, uh, let, let me ask one of them. So, what do you think about consumer behavior? So, the um, saving patterns, the attitude towards, uh, well, consumption and consumerism. Does consumerism have a future in the post COVID world? Well, um, if you look at the numbers at this moment, I mean, I, will, I know a little more about the advanced countries. What you have noticed over the last three months when people were in the lockdown and until now has been people have been saving money. Because in a sense, everyone is worried. So you build up saving, you build up your own resilience. So you see a huge increase of savings in the US in Europe, for example, I mean, the, in the advanced countries, as con there is a major concern about, should I, I'm going to keep my job? Uh, so I need to deal with so many uncertainties that the only resilience I have is whatever money that I receive from my boss is to save it. And of course, because if you are in lockdown, you are not maybe in a mood to go out, to go to a restaurant. So you are just going to the basic things, you know, so you are reducing your consumption. And one of the main concerns about forecasting, you know, global growth or, you know, growth in different economies is the behavior of consumers. 
And what the concern is, if we have a huge increase of saving, you are going to see major difficulties because, you know, companies don't have uh, supply, so they don't want to invest, you know, because uncertainties about uh, potential demand mean that, you know, companies also, as another behavior, you know, it's better to wait before I invest because I don't know what the demand will be all about. So this is a tendency we have at this moment in the global economy that would prevent, you know, a strong recovery is the behavior of the household, higher saving, and the concern by companies not to invest until we have better clarity. So uncertainties is clearly the major top key word here. Uh, okay, there are a few questions about the effects of, oops. Oh, sorry, you can buy computer. Uh, <laughs> I see the light uh, here, so well, I, I thought you run away. No, 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 uh, no. So there are a few questions, quite a few questions, I should say, about the future of inequality. Inequality is a big topic. Yeah. And um, well, I, actually, I would uh, I will divide it into two separate questions. First, what do you think about within countries inequality? That is, what social groups will be harmed? What social groups will benefit from all this situation with pandemic? And another question: What about between countries inequality? That is, will developed countries care more about developing ones because now it's clear that whatever problem there is in developing country, it very quickly spreads all all over the world. Or maybe some other effect will make it the opposite. Well, uh, very good. I think the same here. You see, I believe that before COVID, you know, one of the major, you know, external uh, externalities of the globalization has been an increase of inequality within countries and among countries. If you look at the US, which is, I think, the case in point, but also in China. So you see this increase of inequality due also that we were moving away you know, from what I will call the provider, the state becoming a provider of the social safety net. I mean, in Europe, you know, for many years, the policy was orthodoxy in terms of fiscal policy to reduce, you know, the, the welfare state, if you wish. But it seems to me that we might be going to a shift, meaning that, uh, and that's when I call reper the, the repurposing the state, that clearly you have among the population all around the world the need for the state and the government to provide a new social contract. And this social contract should, and that's why we say, you know, it might be a basic income, universal income might emerge. Uh, I know that, in, I mean, in our own country, you know, government has been putting different type of uh, support for the household in case uh, they were dealing with a huge, um, impact of the crisis, you know. So remember what the U.S. has been doing during COVID-19, sending checks to people based on their income. But uh, I think it was $1,200 per person. Uh, so it's like a universal income. So in a world where the economics of platform has increased inequalities, because you see monopolies of a couple of companies, you see some, you see, ah, oh, Apple, stock, or Amazon billionaires, you know, his wealth, you know, doubled in the last six months. At one point, uh, you will see the government will change the tax, the, the tax system to try to become a more progressive state. I will believe that you will see a, a need and really, uh, because this is what the population will ask for, uh, a way to change uh, taxations in order to try to reduce this inequality within the countries, and that's very clear. Uh, and you will see a demand for more solidarity and the need for a new social contract. Uh, okay. Um, so the relation between the pandemic and the climate change problem. So do you think that personal strategies of people will change? Because the, before COVID-19, the uh, movement was very popular. that We should become more eco-friendly. We should uh, produce less garbage. We should care about our planet. 
But now, when uh, the economy is in recession, it seems that, uh, well, this people sort of put back all these ideas because it's harder just to survive for them. Do you think that uh, the trend for eco-friendliness and fighting climate change will reverse? Because no, people, people will, will make decisions sure. differently. No, I think it will accelerate. If you look at um, on the macro, because we were talking about macroeconomics, um, the proposal within in Europe and in the EU with the European Recovery Fund is all about the green economy, it's meaning that when a government is going to receive the amount of money from the European Union, and the numbers are quite huge, if you take at Italy, it's almost 80 billion euro, which is you know quite dramatic you know, in terms of transfer. You know, the plan will be that whatever project Italy will submit to the European Union, it needs to be green. If you are going to build infrastructure, if you are going to build uh, whatever new uh, plant, it should be always green driven. I think households, and there is a wake up call, if you think about um, the outcome of COVID-19, when people talk about social distancing, okay, we, need, we have to be very worried Everyone wanted to live in big cities. There was this tendency that big cities were the place to be because you believe that job opportunities are here. You have now another tendency that I think are going to be there as a new permanent features in, in, different, play, in different countries. Why should I live in, a, in New York, London, Paris, where in fact I see clearly that in a world where pandemic become more frequent, don't forget, this pandemic was a part of a series of epidemics that we used to have for the last few years. SARS, Mars, whatever, you know? So it was not some, but we didn't pay attention. Okay, there was the best of time to travel, come for two days. Look at the behavior of people is changing dramatically. I don't think that people will want to go back to what we used to be, or go back what people say to normal. I think you are going to have a movement to embrace and to use a pandemic as an opportunity really to change things structurally. That is going to be anchored again. You know, people, if you go to Paris today, over the last few months, what you witness? Biking everywhere. People don't take the cars. Everyone is taking a bike to go to, to walk or just to, to be around. So I think livable cities, the way we believe about big cities will change dramatically. If we live in a period of, uh, you know, walking from home, it's a new normal. You know, before people will say, well, you know, I need to go to the office. And you wonder, that was the assumption, you know, uh, we need to go to the office at nine o'clock. You know, so everyone were going, you know, at nine o'clock to office and you have a huge traffic jam. So I think we are changing our patterns to walk because technology is enabling us to do that. So that's why the state will have an important and a dramatic role because it can really uh, anchor a need to improve, you know, global connectivity, to improve the network. So all these things are going to be so important for a country to, to grow, you know. And yes, it's going to be more local. We were going to be in a world that is going to be more local. Yeah, you will enjoy more where you are because you, you realize, well, I live in a beautiful territory, beautiful place. Maybe you will travel less, but you will need also to be more digital, but you will need to understand that you know, in terms of macroeconomic terms, you have a huge debt overhang at the global level. And at one point, in terms of global macroeconomics, one of the major discussions we are going to have, what are we going to do with this huge amount of debt that we have to issue to deal with COVID-19? And I believe that the only solution will be goodbye debt, you know, because... Uh, Government and central bank will need to, you know, to not to default, but they will find a way, you know, from an accounting point of view, to say, well, we need to start from zero, and that's the way the world will look like. Okay, uh, we have a participant who has sent a few questions to the chat, so maybe it's better that I promote her to the panelists. Uh, Linka, do you hear us? Do you want to ask uh, your questions yes, yourself? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so my concerns uh, with the COVID pandemic and how the world will look afterwards economically and politically are 
mainly regarding security and personal uh, security. I mean, with the COVID pandemic, we saw a huge uh, increase in uh, investment when it comes to digital technology, and a lot of that is currently going to quantum computing. But doesn't that uh, doesn't that also come with huge risks uh, relating to the uh, insecurity uh, that people will face? Uh, and also, is a UBI a feasible measure for the long term? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Well, I. I'm convinced that uh, you know, universal basic income is a thing to come. Because at one point, we see you, we need to reduce uncertainties. And government, if you start to think about what was, you know, when you look back at World War II, you look back at you know, taxation in the US, it was very high. It was almost 70%. When you look at what the government were doing after World War II, you know, it was all about providing a social safety net to people. Of course, there are differences between emerging markets and advanced countries, but I believe that there will be a trend toward basic income because the concern for government and the concern for many countries around the world is that also one of the outcome of COVID-19, importantly, has been the increase of poverty. If you look at Latin America, if you look at other emerging markets, you know, as I agree that people first, they want to live, they want to survive, they want to go to work because they have no choice. You know, there is, at one point, you know, work is, uh, is a key to bring food to the table. So government, we need to deal, unfortunately, in the short term with maybe an increase of poverty. This is why I believe, you know, social solidarity, global solidarity would be critical. That's why we have international institutions to help government to weather these uncertainties. And I think um, uh, I see, you know, as main priority is not anymore about, you know, uh, fiscal orthodoxy. It's all about we need to spend for people and to look at the way to revive growth, but in a different, um, in different form. Okay. Uh, Ilinka, are you satisfied? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We have a raised hand from a person with the nickname Arai. Let me promote Arai to the panelists. Yeah. Please, your question. Um, thank you so much. So I wanted to ask, how can we as a young people, as a young generation, help our world to remember about the ecology even during the pandemic? Because right now the focus is mostly to the healthcare, but not the climate change. Can you give some advices to all the nations here? Well, this is good that um, you get inspired uh, to, to go to the that, that I mentioned. Yes, you see, in, if you look at uh, the priorities of government at this moment all over the world is to deal with the pandemic. I mean, uh, and I can understand there are trade-offs, you know, should we, should, for example, you, you see what's been happening in Europe. We have some lockdown in Italy, in France, in Spain. And after they reopened the economy, we believe everything was right. And again, now we have a huge number of cases. Okay? And you have these tensions you know, between generations. Oh, this is all about the young people. I don't think we should single out anyone responsible here. I think what I believe should be the driver, because at one point, let's face it, we are going to find a treatment to this pandemic because I think we have creative mind around the world who will find a positive outcome, vaccine, or whatever treatment to deal with the pandemic. But we know that now this pandemic are going to become more frequent. This is like financial crisis. Remember, we have over many years financial crisis in emerging markets and in advanced countries. And we realize, you know, no one was able to forecast them. We always said, ah, oh, we knew that there was imbalances that there was, you know, concerns about financial stability in the U.S., but at the end, the financial crisis triggered, and after we try to think about crisis prevention. We need to do the same thing with pandemic. We need to invest more in prevention of crisis and better health system. So how this thing has everything to do with climate change? Because the ecosystem and why we have all these crises depend also in our environment. But because the young generation, I believe, um, is more committed, you know, to save the planet, is more willing, you know, to find solutions. And I think technology will help, you know, achieve that outcome. So we need to, 
Uh, and that's why I think there is a signal from the European Union that the fact that the world you know, recovery fund has a huge amount of money that's already committed, we need to go only if there is a green project. So this is a good moment. That's why I believe Nestle looked just as a, a, a negative effect of this pandemic. But let's believe that we are not going to go back to where we are in January or in, you know, before, but we need to start from scratch. And technology will enable us that to do that. All right. Thank you. And maybe the last question, uh, actually, that's from me because I'm I'm constantly wondering about the following. Uh, you, you can read very often on the media that uh, the recession uh, which we are in now is mainly caused not by the coronavirus itself, but by the government response. So everything is shut down. Um, it's forbidden to go out in many places or it's forbidden to participate in social activities. So do you think, do you think to what extent this is actually true and to what extent it is people themselves being responsible and not participating in the economic activity? So if there is no government intervention in prohibiting uh, social activities, would people uh, be responsible themselves or is it a lot of uh, intervention actually required to fight the pandemic that we are in? Well, I think, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my discussion, this is clearly uh, a crisis by decree because government has forced, you know, people to stop working or, you know, to lock down for one reason, you know, health was a priority for every government, I think, uh, to deal with this crisis. So, so the recession has been in use, as I mentioned before, it's not ah, we have a problem in the financial sector, like in 2008, that triggered, you know, contagion effect in the real economy, in the behavior of the household and the private sector. Remember 2008, you know, subprime crisis, bank went down, bursts, all of these things has a huge impact in the U.S. and to the global, to, to the world, and have what we call now the global financial crisis. Here, COVID-19 has triggered uh, uh, a stop in economic activity, you know, so th there was a sudden stop. Suddenly, we decided not to produce anymore. People were not able to go to work and everyone was in a standstill. It's like, a, you know, in a, in a bankruptcy, you know, where you, got, you, you need to, you know, your company is not doing well, so you go to the, to the bankruptcy court and they give you time, so you suspend your activity and you find a way to reorganize your business. So this is what more or less the government is doing. We have a health problem. We need to do a standstill. We need to stop the activity. We need to look at our balance sheet. And we need to find a way with this, because we have so many uncertainties, when the COVID-19 will be over, are we going to find a treatment? Uh, do we know how to deal with, uh, is our health care will be responsible and has a capacity to deal with, uh, with, uh, with the people? So I think, the outcome of all of that has been, and I believe, and I can uh, recommend that most of the government delivered something very concrete to the people. I mean, they help the household sector, they help the small medium companies, they help and they ask the bank to provide credit to many companies. So I think despite this inactivity, there has been a lot of support. The question is, if we are going to get out of this support, is the global economy and the countries where, you know, can do it without the support of government. And if tomorrow our government here in France is, is stopping all the support to companies to us all, I don't think we can, um, the economy can weather the, the, the shock. That's why they said, you know, we do whatever it takes. This is a whatever it takes moment, if you wish. Whatever it takes, so that's like the Federal Reserve, as the central bank, we do whatever it takes to save the economy because this is, not, this is not a crisis because we have a problem in one particular sector. This is because we need to save people. And until we don't have a treatment, we will need to go to the stop and go activity. The question is that government will need to prepare themselves, not about how to deal with this current crisis, but how I am going to, if you want, on the reorient my country, reorient my activities. And that's why I think the possible 
will be clickable right away. You know, remember in Europe, you know, go against the Maastricht Treaty, meaning that you cannot spend under three percent of your fiscal um, of your budget. Now it's over. If you look at the fiscal deficit in most European countries, it's almost eight, ten percent. It's billion trillions. Look at the U.S. You know, with the the, uh, the, the support, uh, the first package. So I think. I recommend, you know, the fact that government, you know, delivered a lot of support. I believe that we are entering a, a lot of 